I'd invite you back again to Matthew in his gospel, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew says five different times or points us five different times to specific thoughts or instances or events that he says bring a fulfillment to what God said was going to happen, what God said in the Old Testament. We saw the first couple of weeks uh, some pretty straightforward predictions about Jesus. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you'll call his name Jesus. We go back to Isaiah 7, and we see Matthew said, Jesus' birth fulfills what Isaiah said back then. Prediction, fulfillment, makes sense. The next week we saw the reference where Herod asks these men, well, where is Messiah going to be born? And they're able to tell him right from Scripture, from Micah the prophet. Micah says he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Prediction, fulfillment. But then last week, well, we saw a statement there that says that Jesus being taken to Egypt to avoid Herod's death edict fulfilled, Matthew said, that which was spoken by the prophet saying out of Egypt, I've called my son. He's quoting from Hosea chapter 11. Go back to Hosea chapter 11. The son in that verse is the nation of Israel, not Jesus. So we began to see that when we talk about fulfillment, it's more than just a prediction and that coming prediction coming true. God is through Jesus Christ... Filling full all that he has said. And there's a depth of meaning and significance and intention to those things that happened in the Old Testament that find their ultimate filling full in Jesus Christ. And we'll see that even more this morning as we see that next statement in which Matthew directs our thoughts back to the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15, we read, He was there in Egypt until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, they tricked him, deceived him, didn't come back like he said. He was exceeding wroth. Adam and I were talking yesterday about you know, the, the benefits and, of, of different translations of Scripture, and, and they're beneficial but there are some things I just don't think you're going to improve on the King James. It just sounds, he was very angry. No, he was exceeding wroth. <laughs> Herod didn't want anybody threatening his power, his authority. So he was exceeding wroth and he sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. You don't see that on a lot of Christmas cards. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying, in Ramah was there a voice heard. Lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. They are no more. Well, as we read a text like this, this brings up a pretty obvious and straightforward question as we read this verse. And a lot of philosophical questions, a lot of moral questions, issues to, to think about. But before we can let Scripture help us understand those, we need to ask a very basic question. Uh, who is Rachel? And why is she weeping? Make sense? So far in Matthew, we've, we've heard about Mary and Joseph and Herod the king and wise men from the east. If you read in Luke's gospel, we know about Zechariah and Elizabeth and the birth, the miraculous birth of John the Baptist. This is the first mention of anybody I've heard named Rachel in this passage. So who is Rachel? Why is she weeping? 
You can keep your spot there in Matthew. We'll be back there eventually. But go back to Genesis chapter 35. God had come to a man named Abraham. And had made a covenant promise with Abraham saying, I am going to... I want you to come and go where I'm telling you to go. And Abraham started sojourning, dwelling in tents, living temporarily place to place in the part of the world that we now know as Israel. And God promised him, I'm going to give you all of this land. You are going to possess all of this land and I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Your offspring will be a great nation and will possess this land. God said, I'm promising you that. And when Abraham died, Abraham had all of one son. And that son's name was Isaac. Well, Isaac married a woman named Rebecca. And the two of them had two sons. Father of many nations. Off to a great start. Two grandkids. But those two sons, Esau and Jacob. And God made it very clear that even though Esau was the older, and custom and tradition says the older one gets all the stuff, God said, I'm going to work and fulfill my promise to Abraham through his younger son, that younger grandson, Jacob. Well, Jacob had quite a life and story as well. We don't have time to unpack all that. But Jacob wound up getting married to at least one woman named Rachel. There's a lot more to unpack there, but we'll just stick with that. For, that's what has more direct bearing on us right now. Rachel was his, was his love. Well, Jacob, who had an encounter with God, and God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Jacob had a few more sons. Born to Rachel and Leah and Rachel's handmaid, and Leah's handmaid. Again, there's more to the story. But they are sojourning in the land that God said to Abraham, you are going to possess this land. You and your offspring will possess this land. And now here they are, third generation, still living as sojourners, temporary residents, if you will, in this land that God had promised to give to Abraham. And so now Jacob and Rachel have grown up in years as well. And we read in Genesis chapter 35 and verse 15, Jacob, or verse 16, they journeyed from Bethel, which is just north of, up north of Jerusalem. And there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed. And she had hard labor. She was with child and she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, you will have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, son of my sorrow, son of my misfortune. Rachel is weeping. But his father called him Benjamin. Son of my right hand. And Rachel died and was buried in the way, on the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave. That's the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. And if you're to look at a map, that Rama is, it's about 11 miles or so from Bethlehem. So it's close, but it's not exactly close in that sense. But from Ramah, somewhere between Ramah and Bethlehem, somewhere in the vicinity of Ramah is where Rachel passed away. Rachel died giving birth to Jacob's son, Benjamin. Rachel died giving birth there, and we see her weeping. Weeping with joy, certainly over the birth of a son, but also weeping knowing that she is leaving this son. In sight, if you will, on the way to Bethlehem. And as Matthew records Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, there's something that draws his attention to Rachel. As he looks at this circumstance of the slaughter of the infants in the vicinity of Bethlehem, his mind is linked to the weeping of Rachel. Rachel. 
Well, to understand how he gets there a little bit more, Ramah is mentioned by the prophet Jeremiah. And that's where Matthew directs our attention. He takes our attention to Jeremiah because Jeremiah thinks back to this instance as well and has something to say about it. In Genesis, we see Rachel, who is the wife of Jacob, the patriarch of the nation of Israel, weeping with joy over birth, but mostly with sadness over leaving this son within sight of Bethlehem. Well, in Jeremiah, we see a very different picture. By the time Jeremiah writes, centuries have passed. And God has kept his promise to Abraham, a lot of it. His people did grow into a great nation. And he took them down into the land of Egypt. And they dwelled there for about 400 years and were in bondage and affliction. And God sent Moses to bring them out and bring them back into the land he had promised to give to Abraham. See, that's why it's called the promised land. Not because when you got in there, everything was perfect and great and wonderful, but because this was the land God promised to give to Abraham and his, and his people. So he had brought them into that land. And he had made conditional covenant with those people to say, here is how you will live before me as your God. And if you will walk in obedience before me, and will trust me and be faithful to me, you will stay in this land and I will bless you. But if you turn away from me and if you follow after false gods and disobey me and rebel against me, I will cast you out of this land. Well, for centuries, God's people pursued false gods and idolatry and pagan worship. And for centuries, God sent prophet after prophet to warn them and to remind them of what he had said and to call them to repent but they didn't. Eventually, the northern kingdom that had split off was carried away into captivity by the Assyrians. And now as we read from Jeremiah, the southern part of the kingdom, Judah, is now being carried into captivity by the empire of Babylon. And part of a custom, one of the ways that Babylon would handle, and well, the Assyrians too, it was pretty common back then, one of the ways that you would handle an enemy like that is you'd split them up, divide them from one another, and scatter them around. You'd come into their land, bring your people in there, and take their people, especially the best and brightest, take them back to your place, kind of re-educate them a little bit, get some benefit there, and take the rest of them and just scatter them off to other places in the world. Kind of hard to muster much of a rebellion and resistance to that incoming power when your people are scattered all over the world. Well, what we read in Jeremiah, in particular Jeremiah 40 mentions this, as they would bring the people of Israel together, the people of Judah together, and prepare to deport them and scatter them, take them back to Babylon and scatter them wherever. The staging area, the very place from which they would depart was the little town of Ramah, just north of Jerusalem. So Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah 31 and verse 15, Thus says the Lord, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Here, Rachel is pictured as the mother of Israel. And whereas once she wept as she departed this life, leaving her son behind, now she weeps in Jeremiah's writing over the departure and deportation of her children. At this place in Ramah, there is lamentation and weeping and mourning. This is where wives and husbands would be torn asunder and separated. This is where parents would be pulled apart from their children, scattered to who knows where, never to see one another again. Lamentation and mourning and weeping. And Jeremiah remembers this is the very area where Rachel herself died giving birth on the way to Bethlehem in what would be the promised land 
we know the expression, boy, you know, if, if so-and-so saw that, he would turn over in his grave. Right? Jeremiah is looking at this situation of the deportation of is, the people of Israel, God's people, saying, Rachel is weeping. Here's the picture. In Genesis, she weeps with joy and with sadness. In Jeremiah, she's weeping over the exile of her children. Because of the sin and rebellion of God's people, they're being carried away. Well, that's quite a picture. But maybe you're wondering, still not quite sure, how does that get us to Matthew? Matthew. Well, Rachel's weeping in Genesis 35, dying in childbirth on the road there. Jeremiah, Rachel's weeping because her children are no more. That's the result of exile. So what is Matthew doing with this instance? Well, in Matthew, she's weeping over this tragic injustice. Once again, wickedness is being poured out upon the people of God. Once again, this time it's a wicked king seeking to destroy the Messiah himself who brutally takes the lives of the infants of Bethlehem. The Matthew narrative, as one writes, laments injustice. Rather than creating some ideal story world in which injustice doesn't exist. You've heard me say often, and this is what I appreciate so much about the truth of God and His Word. God never asks us to pretend. God tells us the truth. God knows the reality of the world in which we live. In fact, this is what He keeps warning us about. That's the problem with turning away from God to go our own way. We were created as human beings in His image. That is, yes, as you look at male and female, we reflect some truths about the, the person and character and attributes of God. We do reflect some of those. But to be an image bearer of God also means that we represent the authority of God on earth. That's what was supposed to happen. God placed the man and the woman there and told them, be fruitful, multiply, and subdue the earth. Run this place. Explore it. Investigate it. See how it works. He wanted us to be representatives of Him on this planet, on this beautiful world He had created. But we decided we'd rather be the authority ourselves. We stepped out from under his authority. We will run the world. We will run ourselves. Well, how well are we doing? This place is a mess. It's not how God made it. That's what we made it. Through that primal drive in our heart that says, I will make my life work, myself, apart from God. Sin entered the world. Death came about by sin. And the history of the world is a bloody history of the results of rebellion against God. And it doesn't matter whether it's the newspaper today or the Gospel of Matthew or Jeremiah the prophet or Genesis 35. Ever since Genesis 3, when we went our own way, sin has entered the world and death has been the result and will be. In Matthew, she's weeping over this tragic injustice. It's worth noting here that we have a lot of uh, extra biblical. There, there, there are many events that occur in Scripture for which you can find uh, the historian Josephus, for example, and other uh, closer historians that will give account of those events that took place. There's historical record outside of Scripture as well about some of those events. There's not a concrete reference in other literature outside the Bible of this event. Herod is known for his atrocities. Herod is known for his paranoia about his kingdom and his rule. Herod is known for even taking out members of his own family that he thought might be a threat to his authority. There's a play on words that works better in Greek than in English, but they used to say, I'd rather be Herod's pig than Herod's son. 
crazy. And it's quite possible there was a fortress that Herod had built that could be seen probably from Bethlehem. It was just a a couple miles away. It's possible he didn't even have to send guys from Jerusalem. He could have dispatched a few soldiers from that local outpost there to go in and take care of that. That may not have even made the papers in Herod's day, let alone make the history books. But it's certainly consistent with the character and behavior of the king. And it certainly reminds us of the injustices that we see in our own day. It's not been more than two months or so since a man in, a, in, in some kind of an SUV or truck just intentionally drove his vehicle through a Christmas parade in Waukesha. Why? This is sin. It's what it does. So Matthew tells us about this event and is able to connect this back to say, here we are in the very same area. And he goes back to what Jeremiah said about lamentation and mourning and weeping. Rachel weeping for her children and not being comforted because they're no more. So here's Rachel and here's why she's weeping. The good news for us and the reason Matthew brings this to us is to help us to remember that Jesus meets Rachel and all who weep. Jesus is called to the comfortless. She's refusing to be comforted because they're no more. Jesus is coming for those who have no comfort. Consider with me As we've mentioned that Jesus Christ was born into a dark and sinful world. At the time of Jesus' birth, nobody was wishing one another a holly jolly Christmas. Nobody was roasting chestnuts on an open fire. But rather soon after the birth of Jesus is the slaughter of these infants. In Matthew's day, as one writer said, Rachel weeps yet again, this time over the slaughter of the children at Bethlehem. No words of comfort are given to her in Matthew. But the very next verse speaks of the death of Herod and the return of Joseph and Mary and Jesus to the land of Israel. Just as in Jeremiah's day, the situation seems bleak. But if we could go back to Jeremiah chapter 31 just for a minute. Maybe you're still there. But Jeremiah 31. Notice that Jeremiah's writing and the word of the Lord does not stop at verse 15. But God speaks. Thus says the Lord, verse 15, A voice heard in Ramah, lamentation, bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping. Don't cry. Don't weep. Refrain your eyes from tears because your work will be rewarded, says the Lord. They will come again from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your end, says the Lord, that your children will come again to their own border. Even in the midst of this bleakness and this darkness, God says, I've not forgotten and there's still hope. I have, verse 18, surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus. God says, I have heard what my children are saying. I have heard what my people are saying. As they're undergoing this harsh judgment, as they're facing deportation, I've heard the cry of their hearts, and here's what their hearts are saying. Lord, you have chastised me, and I was chastised. Like a bull unaccustomed to the yoke, turn me. And I shall be turned, for you are the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. After I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Do you hear the heart? I was wrong. I've rebelled against my God. I've gone contrary to what he said. God's right and I'm not. Lord, you were right. 
You've brought this judgment and I deserve it. What is God's response to that? Verse 20. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spoke against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my heart is troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, says the Lord. And the rest of the passage talks about set up mile markers and set up direction signs because there's going to be a day when my people who are being carried off right now are going to be brought back. Even in the midst of sorrow and bleakness and the consequences of sin and the sinful actions of others, God sees his people, knows his people, and continues to promise to bring his people home. And as Matthew takes our minds back to Jeremiah, his readers would remember that whole passage and remember that God is still at work. This writer continues. He says, Just as in Jeremiah's day the situation seems bleak, but the hope of salvation lives on. Listen to what he said. There are, of course, additional historical parallels in this passage. We saw some of those last week with Jesus as well. When the wicked king Herod orders the slaughter of the innocent children to protect his rule, we naturally think of that Egyptian pharaoh who ordered the slaughter of the Hebrew boys. One child, Moses, escaped the slaughter and went on to deliver his people from captivity and exile. In the same way, Jesus escapes the slaughter of the innocents, ironically, by going into exile in Egypt. Like the Israelites, he is led into Egypt by a man named Joseph, a man who God speaks to in dreams. Like the Jews for whom Rachel wept in Jeremiah's day, this child knows the experience of living in exile. And like the Israelites of Moses' day, he goes through his own exodus from Egypt. Out of Egypt I've called my son. Just as Rachel was comforted in Jeremiah with the promise that her children would be restored. Just as Moses' birth was a sign to the Israelites that deliverance was near. So Matthew's readers are meant to understand that the long-awaited Messiah has been born and the hope of salvation is close at hand. More important, in other rights, than specific nuances that recall Jesus identifying with the time of Israel's exile... The context in Jeremiah 31 also implies this future hope. These painful events surrounding Jesus' childhood and Jesus' own persecuted childhood, he writes, are the anvil on which God would forge the fulfillment of his promises to his people. Ultimately, it will be the cross of Jesus Christ that will usher in that new covenant and fulfill what God promised all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, telling that servant, there's going to be a seed of the woman that's going to crush your head. And here he is. It's Jesus. Christ was born to a dark and sinful world. There's plenty in our world to make us fear right now. There's plenty in our world that is dark. Maybe in your own life there are circumstances that are dark that cause you to wonder where's God and what He's doing. Jesus was not born in some idyllic Christmas card Hallmark movie world. Jesus was born into the real world where you and I live. It's a dark place. It's a sinful place. It's a bloody place. It's a painful place. And that's right where He came. But Jesus is here. There's hope. We're going somewhere. Something else is still coming. Christ calls all who need comfort to repent and hope in Him. We looked at that repentance of Israel pictured by Jeremiah. Lord, you've chastened us and we're chastened. I get the message. It's an old joke we've heard for a long time, or statement, kind of tongue-in-cheek statement we've heard for a long time. For many people, the hardest part about getting them saved is getting them lost. 
I don't know your heart today, but you know, the hardest part for some people, the hardest part of coming to salvation in Jesus Christ is to realize and understand and admit I am not okay with Jesus Christ. I am a sinner and my sin separates me from God and I can't fix that. We are wired to say, okay, well, if I try harder, if I do this, if I stop doing that, maybe I'll be okay. No. Christ had to come and do for you what you cannot do. He had to come and live the life of perfect holiness that you can't, haven't, won't. Repentance is the path to right standing before God. Acknowledge your sin. Just look at God and agree with Him that He's telling you the truth when He says, you've sinned and fallen short. But Jesus got it right. See, there's something that binds all this together. Rachel in Genesis 35, the promise of God in Jeremiah 31. What Matthew writes here goes all the way through to the book of Revelation because we've sung it today. Jesus is coming back. He has died. He has risen. He's coming back. And when he comes back the next time, he's coming back to set right all that sin has made wrong. So let's meet him. Let's put our trust in him. Let's find our hope in him. And let's remember that where we are right now, there may be genuine reason for tears. But when Paul spoke about believers who have died knowing Jesus, he writes to those believers, let's not sorrow like those who don't have any hope. You may find yourself in Rama right now. But don't sorrow as those without hope because there's still a promise. Jesus is coming back. He's going to make this right. We see the repentance of Israel pictured by Jeremiah. And I remember the word that the promises of God's justice, both for his people and for those that reject him. Second Peter chapter 2, Peter writes, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. And I'm thankful for that. He knows how to preserve us. He knows how to get us where he needs us to be. First Peter tells us that. Right now we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Our salvation is waiting, ready to be revealed at the last time, and we are kept by God's power for that salvation. In Christ, I have an inheritance. God's keeping that inheritance for me, and He's keeping me for that inheritance. I'm thankful for that. But the second part of that verse in 2 Peter 9 says that God knows how to rescue the godly from trials, and He knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Think about that. You look around our world and see evil people doing evil things and bearing no accountability. Anybody seen that recently? Peter tells us that not only does God know how to deliver the godly out of trials, he also knows how to preserve, to keep, to guard the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. God sees, God hears, God knows. And nobody is getting away with anything. So what if I'm one of those right now that is under God's judgment? What if I'm one of those right now that has not bowed the knee to Christ and when I stand before Him, I will face His judgment? What about me? Repent. Repent. Now. Turn. Now. Bow the knee. Now. That's the difference between those that will face judgment and those that will not. My judgment has been taken by Christ because we've repented and believed. And there's the call for you. We sang a song at Christmas a few years ago called Born Where the Shadows Lie. That's where Jesus came. I'm thankful that he knows exactly the kind of world that we're living in. And it's the very same kind of world that Jesus himself came into. The very world in which Jesus lived and walked and said, I do always those things which please the Father. We may weep. 
But Jesus calls those who need comfort to repent and find hope in Him. It's in Him that all the promises of God are yes and amen. It's in Him that we find fulfillment. To turn to Him and hope in Him.